Good afternoon, my name is Andrea Petr, professor at Central European University in Budapest and Vienna. And this is the podcast of the subcommittee of history of the Second World War of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences in cooperation with the Kultur Forum Austria in Budapest. The technical support is provided by Mate Obbat. Thank you, Mate. So my guest today is Eleonore Lapin Eppel. She is an Austrian historian living in Vienna. After studying comparative literature and history of ideas in Austria and in Israel, she worked at the Institute of Jewish History in Austria. In 2009, she became senior researcher at the Institute for Cultural Sciences and Theatre History of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and in 2010, staff member of the Center for Jewish Studies at the University of Graz. Although officially re retired, she is very active directing the project uh, Jüdische Reaktionen auf die Nationalsozialistischen Verfolgung, Quellen Edition zur uh, Verfolgung, Vertreibung und Selbstbehauptung der jüdischen Bevölkerung Österreichs 1938-1945. Responses to persecution, documenting life and destruction in the Holocaust, annotated collection of Jewish source materials on the persecution, expulsion, destruction and survival of the Jews in Austria, 1938 and 45. Her major areas of research are the Nazi persecution of Austrian and Hungarian Jews in Austria, transitional justice in Austria and memorial politics in Austria. Her major publications in this field are Uh, uh, Ungarisch jüdische Zwangsarbeiterinnen und Zwangsarbeiter in Österreich 1944 und 1945. And the book what we are discussing today is Topographie der Shoah, Gedächtnisordne an der zerstörte jüdische Wien, zusammen mit uh, Dieter Hecht und Michael Raggen Blech, uh, Wien uh, uh, 2015. She is also uh, working on the field of, uh, of theatre and press, and uh, one of the other uh, books uh, she published is The Jewish Soldiers in the Collective Memory of Central Europe, The Remembrance of World War I from a Jewish Perspective in 2019, together with Gerard Lamprecht and Ulrich Virva. Uh, she has also published an autobiographical writing of Jewish Austrians, as well as a series of autobiographies of Jewish Austrians. And uh, we are here today discussing a book. Uh, please show us the book. Uh, yes, the topography uh, der Shoah, Gedächtnisorte an der zerstörte jüdische Wien. Uh, the book you uh, co-edited uh, and read, uh, wrote together with Dieter Hecht and, and Mihaela Raggan Blesch and published in 2015. So the places of the Holocaust are the iconic places of destruction, like Auschwitz, Bergenbels and Dachau. And uh, these places were under German command, and this gives the false impression that the extermination of the European Jewry has happened somewhere far away done by the Germans. But it is actually started with the neighbors, not uh, returning the greetings or hoping to get the fur coat of their neighbors. But before we start discussing this process, the topography of the Shoah, Uh, in uh, Vienna. I would like to ask you uh, to characterize the Jewish life before, uh, before the Anschluss for those listeners who are not familiar with the topic. Um, well, the situation of the Jews in Vienna prior to the Anschluss was quite ambivalent. Uh, from since the late 19th century, Vienna was quite an anti-Semitic city. As you might know, Karl Loega was the first open anti-Semitic mayor in the world. That means he won the elections with an anti-Semitic program. And at the turn of the century, all major parties had, uh, had anti-Semitism as part of their program. The only exception were the Social Democrats, who didn't have anti-Semitism in their program, but also were not that free from anti-Semitism. Uh, since 1867, Jews enjoyed equal rights as citizens, but they were not accepted in, in society. Uh, at the same time, um, the turn of the century until the Anschluss was a real time of bloom for the Jews of Vienna. 
You must know that more than 90% of the Jews of Austria were living in Vienna. So Vienna is more or less identical with Austria. And this Jewish community of uh, 200,000 flourished. Uh, although Jews were expelled um, from public posts, although they had huge difficulties with university posts if they did not uh, convert, still Jews were major artists, were major scientists, were very, very successful in business. Um, and they felt as Austrians, they felt very attached to Austria. That means Jews always found their niches outside of the universities, outside of the public sphere, where they could do great work. Just let me remind you of Sigmund Freud, who was never accepted to the university and a world-renowned scientist. And there were many like this. So Austrian Jews could feel very, very Austrian. Now, maybe uh, what distinguished the patriotic Austrian Jews from the patriotic Hungarian Jews, that Austrian Jews could feel Austrian without feeling German. They knew that they would not be accepted into the German group, and still in the multi-ethnic Austro-Hungarian Empire, this was no problem. Jews could feel Austrian, could love their country, could be patriots. And this changed overnight with the Anschluss. Uh, so what were the theoretical starting points for this big project? Because this project has taken years of your and your co-workers' lives. So what kind of theoretical uh, discussions uh, informed this big project? One of the major, major influences was, of course, Saul Friedlander uh, with his integrated history. Integrated history means that you do not only write, um, write history from the perspective of the perpetrators, the Nazis, but also from the perspective of Jews. And we really wanted to describe the Shoah in Austria, in Vienna, from the perspective of Jews, using primarily Jewish sources. Of course, we needed the, the Nazi sources uh, in order to explain Nazi, Nazi policy, but we were telling this, this story from the perspective of the Jews. Another important uh, influence um, for me personally uh, was a book by Jacqueline Vincent, Reclaiming Heimat, which is not so well known, but is a beautiful book about Austrian writers coming back to Vienna after the war, emigre writers, and rediscovering the city of the youth, remembering the places of the youth in a very changed city. So what we were trying to do is connect the history of persecution with certain places that the, that the survivors uh, or even the, the people during persecution remembered. So for us, memorial sites are not necessarily places where you find plaques today, where you find monuments, but they were the places where the persecution and survival of the Austrian Jews took place in the places that they remember. Mm -hmm. And what were the methodological problems of this project? Well, there were <laughs> quite a number of them. Just uh, one of the problems is if we want to have the voices of the, of the victims, you're using um, so-called ego documents, autobiographical writing. And there you have a big problem, and this is coded language. Yes? Um, People who were uh, writing letters in the Nazi period used coded language. First of all, they were afraid of censorship, but there was also a lot of self-censorship because in the letters, they didn't want to disturb the recipients of the, of the letters. Even diaries, in many ways, were written in coded language. And we had to break up the code. Now, there are also um, so official documents. We were very using a lot of documents from the Jewish community, primarily the reports of uh, Josef Löwenherz that he had to give to the, to the Gestapo and to the SD about his work. And of course, these reports, although you can really see the developments um, as they occurred, were of course also in coded language. 
because he had to write in a, in a language that would appeal to the to the Nazis if he wanted to get some kind of improvements or save some part of his community, he had to use a language that was appropriate to the thinking of the Nazis. So coded language was one very, very um, important uh, feature of our documents that we had to, to consider. Another one was that we wanted to portray the Jewish population uh, with all the different age groups. Now, if you look at um, autobiographies, they were, of course, written, they were written after the war. Many of these people were very young. They were, they were, many of the, of the autobiographies were written by, by child survivors. Now, one of the big challenges was to get um, the voices of the elderly. The elderly people who were left behind in Vienna because they had no chances to, to, to find a place of rescue uh, and who died. And we were really looking for documents that would show their fate, show their reactions, and maybe even have their voices, little postcards or descriptions of other people who were taking care of them or diaries. Um, again, this was to really show the whole press of the different age groups in Vienna was one of the really big and important uh, challenges. Another one is that um, I was talking about coded language during the Nazi period. Another problem was that after the war, the survivors wanted to make sense of what they had been going through. So certain narratives developed. People were telling their stories to each other, interpreting them, and then developing narratives that not necessarily corresponded with the way they had been, um, what they really had been going through. So again, you had to see behind the narratives and to find out those aspects, um, uh, what they had the, the facts, what they had really been going through when they were telling certain, uh, certain things. Mm -hmm. So you already mentioned the variety of sources you have used, um, uh, diaries, postcards, uh, different ego documents. So where did you find uh, all this uh, evidence and uh, uh, how could you reconstruct based on those very challenging documents the institutional network of Jewish life in uh, Vienna? And how did you do this work, actually, among uh, three of you? How did you divide this uh, Herculean task? Well, first of all, uh, we were dividing chapters. People, you know, we knew what was interesting. You know, every, each and every one of us three had certain things that were more interesting to them that they felt closer to. And these were the chapters that we were dealing with primarily. Uh, that's why we also have our names uh, with certain chapters. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for me, as being the director of the project, I always had to keep the big narrative in, in, in view. It means I had to really try to hold the strings together. And what was also important is to have a unified book. We were three authors with different interests, with different approaches, and you wanted to write a unified text. So what was <clears throat> very, very important is that we were uh, constantly reading texts to each other and discussing them and asking questions. And by asking questions, we also found out what was still missing, what details we still had to do research on. And then in the end, when we had done all the research, we had to reread everything and shorten it. And this was the most painful part of the whole story. But by talking to each other, exchanging ideas, discussing it, I think that's what really um, <clears throat> unified the text and made it into one book. Uh, and what, uh, where did you find all these uh, documents? So what kind of archives uh, have you consulted? A very important source was the archive of the Jewish community. Because they have, the Jewish community in Vienna uh, existed right to the end of the war. So the archive existed right to the end of the war. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, in the post-war period, um, when there was heavy doubt that this community would continue to exist, 
a big part of these documents were sent to Israel. So you have the archive of the community in Vienna and in Jerusalem, but the archive is there. And this was where the central documents um, for the, uh, for the um, organizational structures. And I think that uh, nobody has been looking through this archive as thoroughly as we did. Really looking into all aspects of documents that they had there, using them, presenting them, discussing them. And then also, of course, doing the same in Israel. Of course, there are also Austrian documents of the Austrian State Archive, of the Viennese um, Provincial Archive, where we find a lot of documents, for instance, on Aryanization, on the process of Aryanization. And in these documents, you also find a lot of Jewish faith, yes? Because, and then after the war, when people tried to um, reclaim their property, they told their stories. So these are very important documents that you can find here in Vienna. Another wealth of documents were in the, um, in the Austrian resistance arch archive. Where right in the 80s, they, have, they started uh, with a project called Erzählte Geschichte with interviews with survivors. Very important collection that we were that we were using, and of course they were also they are uh, collecting documents to persecution, to resistance, to survival in Vienna. So these were really basic, big um, uh, archives that we were using in Austria. Now, with regard to the autobiographical writings, of course there I must uh, of course uh, mention Yad Vashem in in Jerusalem. Uh, the Leo Beck Institutes in uh, New York and in London, uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, Wiener Library. All these archives have hold very important um, documents, particularly on personal faith. They also have, uh, have uh, photographs, which were very important for our book. Maybe I should um, talk a little bit of how we used photographs. Because for us, they were not just um, illustrations, but really documents. We only used those photographs where we knew where they were taken. What are they depicting? Where were they taken and when? And in many, many cases, we did a lot of research until we knew at least a big part of the people who were in the picture. So these photographs really became documents of events and of personal faith. Uh, and these we also found in the different, in the, in the different archives. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Holocaust literature, there is a term which comes up very often, namely that the Jewish life was destroyed. And this is a euphemism for a very complicated process, what you actually describe in this major book, uh, namely that um, uh, it's a very long, painful process, how a vibrant community with all the institutions and uh, uh, important personalities are being systematically uh, destroyed. So from this process, what you were describing uh, in the case of Vienna, what can we learn, uh, which we did not know about the history of the uh, Shoah? Um, I wouldn't say that we learned something we did not know, but maybe something that we did not take sufficiently seriously. For us, the aspect of agency was central. The Jewish population in Austria for us was not the passive victim. Yes, they were struggling all along, from the very point of the, of the, of the German invasion to the end of the war. People were struggling first to get out of the country, secondly, to survive. And this kind of um, agency was very, very important for us. Maybe something that I should also mention is that at the time of the Anschluss, the Nazi policy um, was still the expulsion and, 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 and robbery of Jews. Yes, they wanted to keep the Jewish property and get rid of the Jews. Now the brutality of the of the of the persecution in Vienna was also a means to get rid of the Jews, and it worked. It worked because three quarters of the Austrian Jewish population 
left. Although most countries closed their doors, and although after the beginning of the Second World War, it was very, very difficult to leave, but they left. Uh, Two thirds survived because um, about 16,000 later on were caught by the Wehrmacht in places of, 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 of refuge. But, but it's still, you must consider two thirds of the Austrian Jewish population survived. And that's a big number. And that's also, um, and this has to do because we were the first ones to be occupied by the Nazis and we were still, um, the, the, the Jewish community was still faced with a different kind of Nazi policy. This policy later changed starting with the beginning of war. We had the first deportations from Vienna in October 1939 to Nisko. They had to be stopped because um, the Nazis just were not ready to build a big reservation in the general government in, in Poland. And then the deportations in Vienna again started very early in the spring of 1941. That means uh, the Jewish poly Austria was also a kind of experimental lab uh, for Jewish policy of the Nazis. First expulsion, and when this didn't work, deportation, and when this didn't work, annihilation. And I think that's also very interesting. And the Jews, uh, but because of the fact that, for instance, at the time when the deportation started in the spring of 1941, um, it was still possible to leave Austria. There was this kind of overlapping development. And I think this also is a reason why there was so much agency. People really struggling and trying to get out, trying to survive right to the end. You already mentioned this agency, the concept of agency, and uh, also showing uh, Jews as active uh, uh, resistors. So what were the spaces and the resources of resistance? And were there any non-Jewish organizations which were trying to help in this particular context? When you talk about resistance in the traditional meaning, armed resistance, or even sabotage, um, there was very little. There was some among the Jews in, in, in Vienna. Uh, what is interesting, uh, um, among the people who, who survived in hiding, some of them did sabot- acts of sabotage. There was not so much in, uh, among the others. Uh, most Austrian resistance was abroad in countries of refuge. But there is something that for us uh, is a concept that was developed, what was de- important for us was a concept developed by Dan Michmann, of Yad Vashem in 1960, and that's the concept of Amida, of self-assertion, yes? That Jews tried to work against the Nazi policy simply by struggling to get out, to survive, to remain human, facing a regime that wanted to make them, turn them into inhumans. Now, with the organization, there was, of course, the Jewish community, that was later turned into the Council of Elders. And uh, in many ways, this was also an organization of self-assertion. For instance, there were one, this is one of the few communities that did not put together transportation lists. What they did do, of course, is give the names of the Jews and their addresses to the Nazis, but they refused to actively put together transportation lists. And then they were constantly trying to improve the situation of the Jews who were still in Vienna. So I think this is something that we also have to take into consideration. They were forced to collaborate with the Nazi regime. But when you read their their documents, you can see that they were still trying to find little back doors for small improvements, or at least for hope for improvement. There were also non-Jewish uh, aid uh, associations, like the Quakers, uh, who were very important in the beginning uh, when, they were try- when they were able to get visa, uh, particularly for England uh, and for the United States. They were very active in putting together kinder transport, children's transports. And in, and in the end, there were an aid organization even until the first deportation. Now, the problem is that many of the Quakers were British. As soon as the war broke out, 
they had to leave Austria. And then in, in, in 1941, also the American members of the Quakers had to leave. But they, they did a lot of help. Another group were the, <clears throat> were the um, Swedish Israel mission. <clears throat> Those were missionaries who were trying since World War I to mission to, to proselytize Jews in Austria. <clears throat> when the Nazis came, uh, they did less proselytization, but they try also helped to get Jews out of Austria. Now, this was important because <clears throat> the Jewish community was allowed to assist only their members. Those people of Jewish descent who were not members of the Jewish community, who were either uh, Christians or without a, a religious affiliation, had no big organization to assist them in the attempts of flight. And so there was the, the Swedish mission for the Protestants. The Quakers were very much for the people without religious affiliation. And then, of course, there was the Catholic uh, aid organization, which, which, by the way, was the only one that could exist until the end of the war. And the reason for this being that, that, that Cardinal Initzer uh, held his hand over it. Very, it's very interesting that this Catholic aid organization uh, existed right through the war. When you read the testimonies of the people who were working in the different aid organizations, you had the feeling that they were um, holding it against the Jewish community, that they as a big community only worked for the Jews. There's a lot of bitterness. And then you look at the documents from these organizations and you see that they have all cooperated all along. They have cooperated among each other and they have cooperated with the Jewish community. The non-Jewish organizations had to cooperate when they were trying to get visa because many Jews went to different aid organizations to apply for visas. Now, if, they, and, um, um, if two aid organizations got visa for this, same person, one visa was lost. So they cooperated on visa. But they also cooperated with the Jewish community. At that time, the Jewish community even gave them money to help people escape from Vienna. And still after the war, there was so much feeling of competition and bitterness, which is maybe not <clears throat> easy to understand. So for us, it was very important to show this aspect of cooperation. There is a special category, the forced laborers, and you have done a lot of work uh, in uh, exploring this uh, particular uh, category. And uh, what was very interesting for me when I was reading this book, that how these forced laborers were actually living in the city. And I was wondering, uh, uh, what do you think the impact of this cohabitation was? I think that the impact was not too strong. Uh, you know, after all the brutality of the persecution, the brutality that also came from the civil population, not just from the SS, not just from the police, but also from the neighbors, as you have mentioned in the beginning. Jews, uh, there was a big, big distrust of the Jews towards the neighbors. And on the other hand, <clears throat> the neighbors knew very, very well that the regime didn't want them to be friendly with Jews. So the Jews were living in Vienna. They were sharing houses with non-Jews, which is also interesting. Vienna never had a ghetto. They were all, they were all, Jews were always living in houses with non-Jews, which was also a way of checking on them because the non-Jewish neighbors would report them to the police. So again, <clears throat> a lot of distrust was a, a lot of hatred. So this cohabitation was basically a very unhappy one. Unhappy one for the Jews, where, who invariably had Nazi neighbors who were, who were making life difficult for them. But on the same time, they were not squeezed into ghettos. They had a certain standard of living that was, was much better than in other ghettos because they were living together with, with other with non-Jews. 
On the other hand, Jews were squeezed into collective apartments. You had apartments with four, five, six families, depending on the, on the size of the, of the apartment. Sometimes families had to share single rooms. So they were squeezed together, but they were living within regular houses. In the end, the Nazis forbade that the apartments where Jews were living had bathrooms with running water inside, but still they were living in houses. So <clears throat> you might ask who were these people who were living in Vienna right to the end of the war? Because uh, basically the Jewish population of Vienna was deported by the end of 1942. Those who remained in Vienna, they're mostly living in so-called mixed marriages. That means they had non-Jewish partners, non-Jewish and, and non-Jewish <clears throat> children. And they were living together with other Austrian neighbors right to the end of the war. And what, what, and what was really, for me, very painful to read the stories that right to the end of the war, there were attacks on people who were wearing the yellow star right to the end of the war. It just did not diminish. There were only a few thousand Jews left, and when they walked in the streets, they were in danger. So you can imagine the results of the cohabitation of Jews and non-Jews in Vienna. Uh, so let's choose one story, one story of one site, and uh, the listeners might have visited the Freud Museum. Uh, so uh, what happened with that particular apartment of the Freud family? Because I think that might give a uh, kind of good insight of what happened uh, uh, with the Jewish population in, um, in Vienna and how the uh, relationship between the neighbors and the Jewish uh, uh, citizens uh, uh, had improved or worsened or actually ended up in, uh, uh, in this total distrust, what you have explained. Well, um, Freud was living in the ninth district. And this was, with regard to the size of the Jewish population, the second biggest Jewish district. Uh, about 10% of the Jewish population lived in the ninth district. And um, Vienna was uh, always plagued by a housing problem. So as soon as the Nazis came, people wanted to have Jewish apartments. And Jews were driven out of their apartments brutally by their neighbors or by, 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 by the official offices of the city of Vienna and had to move in with other Jewish families. Now, this meant that in areas where you had <clears throat> a big Jewish population to begin with, the density increased. So the ninth district, where there were many where apartments of Jews, like Freud's apartment, other Jews were put into these apartments. So Freud left, <clears throat> and people who had been expelled from their apartments moved into his apartment. Um, the people who were, were forced to move into Freud's apartment were primarily elderly people who did not have a chance to, to escape, who, could not, uh, who did not have the money or the strength or the initiative to leave Vienna. Now, among the people who lived in Freud's apartment, 16 became victims of the Shoah. We, we have looked at their, looked at their fates and uh, 16 were murdered. This was the majority of the people who had, were forced to move into the apartment of Freud were murdered. Now, they did not all live there at the same time because the Nazis also, this was almost you know, like a brutal game that people had to move into apartments and then after a few months to move out to a different apartment, each time getting less space until they were deported and killed. So when there are 16 people who lived in this apartment and were killed, they did not live there at the same time. But over the time, that's, that's what happened with the inhabitants of Freud, of Freud's apartment. 
Another uh, important site is the Steinhof, the Otto Wagner Hospital. It's very important because CEU is moving to that site. So I was wondering that uh, it also has a very specific dark history. And I was wondering uh, what kind of uh, uh, insights do you have regarding this Otto Wagner Hospital during the Shoah? The victims of the Otto Wagner Hospital were barely non-Jews. They were mentally or physically handicapped people uh, who the Nazis deemed unworthy to live. Yeah? So uh, in the beginning, the Otto Wagner Hospital was a transit place for people who were then sent to Schloss Hartheim for euthanasia. This stopped in 1940 because of uh, public unrest. The relatives uh, knew, of course, what happened to them. So the Nazis stopped this uh, action T4. So the, later on, these patients died of neglect, of starvation. They just, you know, they, they also made medical experiments. So all in all, about close to 7,000 patients, grown-up patients of the Steinhof died. In 1914, they also opened the children's ward. And again, 800 children died of neglect and also due to medical experiments. And this is where the Jewish history starts. Um, children with, who were handicapped, they often didn't get visa into countries of refuge. So where there were parents who had the possibilities, for instance, to emigrate to the United States, that they could save their families to the United States, but they had to leave their handicapped children, child behind. And many families did this. These children got the Jewish social worker, Franzi Löw, as a guardian. She became the guardian of all these children who either were orphans to start out with or who were left behind uh, and were now in charge of the Jewish community. Now, the Jewish community didn't have any institutions to take care of these children, so they were in private institutions. And in May 1941, Franzi Löw was told that 23 of these, these uh, children were taken to Steinhof. And she right away knew what this meant. Yes, that this meant children were going to die. So she went to the Rothschild Hospital, to the Jewish hospital, and talked to the head of, psychi of the psychiatric uh, department, the later world famous Viktor Frankl. And he said he would take in five children. He could take in five children. So she ran to the director of, of the hospital, of the Wagner Hospital, and he said, okay, you have to do some paperwork, come back tomorrow. And when she came next, early next morning, all the children were gone. Yes, they were, they were all killed. So this is uh, our connection with Amsteinhof, that's the Jewish connection. But basically, most of the victims were non-Jews. And the big scandal about um, Steinhof was not only what happened during the Nazi period, but what did not happen after the Nazi period. Because many of the um, doctors and the nurses were not put on trial or they get very, got very lenient sentences. And uh, the most well-known name today is Heinrich Gross the doctor of the children's department, yeah, who was uh, really guilty of killing hundreds of children, he got away with a sentence of two years and later on worked as a psychiatrist, made assessments on psychiatric patients, and one day made an assessment of one of, the form of his former patients, Friedrich Zavrel, who had been a child on, in the Steinhof. So Savrel went to the press, this was in the 70s, and it took until the end of the 1990s that Heinrich Gross was put on trial. And then he was so old that he could not stand trial, so he got away. But research that started in the 1990s. And again, it was the Austrian uh, Resistance Archive who did important research on euthanasia, and they also made an exhibit now that you can see uh, in, the, in the Otto Wagner Hospital. So when you're there, we see you go and look at the, at the exhibit. 
Uh, so you described how the uh, everyday life of uh, Jews was um, uh, was changing, and uh, I was thinking about one kind of uh, banal object, which is shoes. Because if you look at the fantastic maps which are attached to this uh, uh, book, you see that uh, uh, you know it was really a problem where to get shoes, how to get it mended, and I was wondering that. Uh, uh, how did you deal with this kind of everyday uh, objects like shoes and how did you get this information and what do you think that this kind of object, the history of this kind of object like shoes, like uh, other everyday items will inform our uh, knowledge about this period? By the end of 1939, Jews were no longer eligible uh, for cards for clothes and shoes. And there was always a shortage of shoes and leather in Austria. So uh, for Jewish families, it was very, very difficult. Where, for instance, when they had growing children and they couldn't get shoes. So one way of, of getting shoes was to go to the black market, which was expensive and very dangerous. And many Jewish, uh, and there were not so many Jewish families who could do that. But the Jewish community had something that was called Kleiderkammer. And there they collected clothes and shoes, even, even some furniture of families first, families who had left, but later on of families who had been deported. And people who needed shoes and clothes could go there and get them, knowing why they were there that the former owners had been deported. They knew that. And as the war progressed and the bombing started, many Jews also left their, uh, lost their apartments uh, with, their last, with their last property. And again, the Kleiderkammer was the last place they could go to. to. But this Kleiderkammer was right in the center of town, behind the, the Jewish community on Latzenhof and Judengasse. Yeah? And this is also an aspect that um, the aid organizations were all in the center of town, other than the Israel mission that was in the ninth district. So a lot of this Jewish life and of Jewish aid and help was right in the center of town. And it was right opposite the Hotel Metropole um, that was the Gestapo headquarter. You know, you could, they could see each other almost. Fascinating. So what happened after the uh, liberations? How the community did or did not build uh, itself up? So, Well, in the beginning, there were lots of Jews in Vienna because uh, Vienna was a hub for DPs, where there was a big uh, Jewish camp, in, uh, DP camp in the Rothschild Hospital, in the former Rothschild Hospital, but 200,000 Jews went through it. Very few stayed because anti Semitism was rampant after the war. You know, the Austrians um, just did not want to have Jews back because they knew that they, that they had profiteered. They had stolen things from them, they had kicked them out of work. They didn't want to have these people back. And those survivors who came back to look for their family, and I must say, of those people, who had been deported, uh, only 1,800 survived, yes? They also came back to a very, very unfriendly city. So the, the Jewish community developed very slowly. Uh, also restitution of, of property went very slowly. And the only way that they could survive in the beginning was because they, they were subsidized by uh, foreign organizations like the Joint. Uh, on the other hand, there were even many people outside of Austria who said maybe this uh, community should not exist. What are they doing there in Vienna? It was anti-Semitic and is anti-Semitic. So many people who stayed here kind of were sitting on their suitcases. And it seemed to be a dying, a dying community. For instance, also when there was, uh, um, <clears throat> when there was the, the revolt in Hungary, Hungarians did come to Austria 
many of them Jewish. They all left again after a short period of time to go to the United States and to Israel. Very few stayed in Austria. This only changed at the end of the 1960s, early 1970s, um, when the first uh, wave of emigration uh, from the Soviet Union came. They had, transit, they had a transit camp in Austria. These people came on the one hand from Russia, but a lot of them also came from Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Georgia, and later on, again, traveled on to Israel or to the United States. Some stayed, and others, particularly from Israel, came back to join them. And all of a sudden, we had young families in Vienna. We had young families with children here in Vienna who were not living under the shadow of the Shoah, who wanted to stay here and wanted to lead a Jewish life here. And Due to this immigration, all of a sudden we could have, again, Jewish schools, Jewish kindergartens. Since the 1970s, Vienna has built a, up a very, very good Jewish infrastructure. And Vienna has been an, a, become an attractive city, for instance, for ultra-Orthodox people. We have a fairly high um, percentage of ultra-Orthodox living in Vienna. And although our community is still small, 8,000, it's one of the very, very few European communities that is growing. Because particularly the immigrants uh, from the Soviet Union, they came here to stay. And we have now already the third generation, and they're staying and they're building up. They are half of our community um, are the Jews from the former uh, Soviet Union. The other half are... Um, Central European, let's put it this way, Central and Eastern Europeans, because there are very few uh, Jews of Austrian origin. Many of uh, the Jews who live here are from families that came after the war. But the, the community is growing. And what was also important, that in the 1980s, there was a generation shift. The post-war generation took over uh, the community. And again, those people of the, of, that was born in Vienna after the war and were staying there, they also wanted to stay. And they, were, they felt as like Austrians. They, were, they had, did not have the fears of their parents. They were quite outspoken as Jews. Uh, and the big turning point was, of course, the election campaign of, of, of Kurt Waldheim. When the Jews spoke up, they spoke up against the lying of Kurt Waldheim. They spoke up against the lies about Austrian, Austria being a victim and not a perpetrator. Um, there was a big shift also in the political narratives in Austria, and the Jews became the vanguard. So Jews, once again, could feel as Austrians. And I think that's what's important today. Mm -hmm. How long have you been working on this fantastic and uh, cutting-edge <laughs> volume? Uh, at least five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. And what were the most important lessons you learned? Uh, so if you would say, you know, why was it worth investing five years of your uh, life in this? What, what was the lesson you learned? First of all, there's a plethora of details that we learned and that, that we did not know about. But that's something that historians like, you know, that's not a, a, a general lesson. But for me personally, what I learned was that you have to be very, very careful with your judgments. Yes. Uh, for instance, what I told you before, this cooperation and this trust of the different aid organizations. Uh, there's also uh, this big narrative of collaboration by, by, by the Jews who survived in Vienna, uh, by the Jewish community, by the Council of Elders. Now, on the one hand, that we, we could show that these people collaborated also, uh, only as much as they had to, and that there was a lot of, of resistance to, to the Nazis. But when the few survivors came back, they all 
filed uh, complaints against them, and they were all investigated by the police and by the courts. Now, of course, you can say that uh, this is this is outrageous that Austrian courts, who didn't, who were not so very active to run after the Nazis, put Jews on court. But on the other hand, there was so much bitterness among the victims that you think that also the victims had the right to to see that those who collaborated had been punished. So there are very different stories. It's very difficult to judge. Was it correct to put these Jews on trials? Most of them did not really get to trial. You know, the police very soon squashed, uh, squashed their, their trials because they could not find indications of, of collaboration. There were some who were indicted and they really had collaborated. And, but there is the question, did the Austrian courts have a right to do this? Was it correct to hand Jews over to the Austrian courts? And this is something, you know, that we were discussing and that we were kind of presenting in our books, but not really putting a final judgment on it. I think this is up to the reader and up to the, um, the persons, have, uh, people have to decide what is correct and what is not correct. And the last question is about the memorial practices of today. So in uh, Amsterdam, when the Jewish Museum wanted to commemorate the Aryanization of the Jewish property and ask the uh, owners of the uh, houses, which were previously owned by those Jews who were deported by the uh, Dutch, uh, that ended up by a revolt. Basically, the Dutch citizens uh, resisted to acknowledge the history of their property they are living in. And uh, the very same thing happened in uh, in Budapest when uh, they tried to adopt this uh, uh, memorialization process with the yellow star uh, uh, houses. And uh, uh, what's the situation now in uh, Vienna? So are there, uh, besides the Stoppelstein, are there any kind of memorialization processes uh, or memory tours which are talking about those sites you have been uh, working on and uh, uh, you actually mapped uh, the whole uh, history of the Shoah in uh, Vienna? Um, there, are, there are initiatives, initiatives of, um, of, of uh, people who live in areas that used to have uh, a big Jewish population. For instance, in the 9th district, there was a very successful um, project by people who live there about the Savitna area, yes? And they also put up a very nice memorial there, uh, which is a kind of glass cube. And when you look down, you see piles of, of, of keys. So the keys of the for, for apartments the Jews had to leave. Quite impressive and it's, it's very, very well done. Uh, there are also, some houses where the Stolpersteine are not on the street, but on the house, house itself. It means the people want to memorialize the Jews who were living there. Uh, one of the signs that, that of, of an increased acceptance of, um, of, of commemoration is uh, the plaque of the Polish synagogue in Leopoldgasse. Because when this was put up in the 1980s, they were not allowed to put it on the house. So what it did is they put the pole in front of the house with the plaque on it. So this way they could uh, uh, commemorate the former synagogue and show that the people resist. So they find, found a very, very strong sign. Meanwhile, the plaque is already on the house. So there is an improvement. There is um, a bigger uh, acceptance also an increased interest in what happened in the houses. Many people want to know who lived in, the, in, in my house. Were there Jews that were expelled and killed? Um, there are also um, audio guides uh, that, that take you through uh, Jewish areas or that tell you the names of all the people who were deported from, from certain houses. Um, and there are still more to come and there are also a lot of uh, school projects being done. 
or a school to come to Vienna and uh, the, the, the students have guided su- tours through Jewish Vienna and, and uh, also learn about the history of the Holocaust. There's an organization called the Inanate. And they organize such tours for children and also for teacher training. So the teachers themselves can carry out Holocaust projects. So <clears throat> a lot is being done. And I think that the acceptance also increases. Thank you very much, Eleonore. Uh, so today we have discussed uh, the book you have uh, uh, directed, uh, this uh, huge monograph, Topography der Shoah, Gedächtnis Orte an der Zerstörte Jüdische Wien. Uh, you did this together with Dieter Hecht und Michaela Raggan Blesch. And uh, uh, please show the book again to the uh, to the uh, viewers that they should see for this uh, fantastic uh, volume. Thank you very much for the Kultur Forum Austria for their support. Thank you, Mate Obaid, for the technical support. And thank you very much for your time and uh, uh, for this fantastic research, which is really eye-opening on so many different levels. Thank you.